وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى تري We're going to go into the second lecture of da'wah and the fiqh pertaining to a da'wah. The understanding of what da'wah is and how should da'wah be given. Yesterday's lecture, we spoke about the meaning of da'wah, which was an introduction. And once we finished that, and we spoke about having a correct understanding of da'wah we spoke about the usul the, the foundations in which da'wah stands on and we said it's three al-ghaya which is an objective and a wasila which is means and the sifat al-da'i the characteristics of the one who's giving da'wah and then in our third point we spoke about after the introduction and the second point which was the usul in which da'wah stands on the third which we spoke about in hirafat deviation that occurs in da'wah whether it be whether it be in the objectives of da'wah or the means that are taken to give da'wah or the characteristics of the da'i and we spoke about that yesterday what are we going to be speaking about today today inshallah ta'ala we're going to be speaking about principles for da'wah. We're going to be speaking about principles and these principles are going to be 22 principles. There are how many? 22 principles. I don't think I will be able to finish these 22 principles. So what I've decided is I'm going to do 11 today and I'm going to do the next 11 on Saturday morning. And on Sunday, we're going to do Bawabit. Bawabit on giving da'wah. And we will know, inshallah ta'ala, what the difference between a Bawabit and a Qawa'id are on Sunday, inshallah ta'ala. And the Bawabit that we're going to be given are also going to be 13 Bawabit. And those 13 Bawabit will be on Sunday, inshallah ta'ala. So today we're going to do 11 Qawa'id. 11 principles and on Saturday we're going to do 11 and that will make us finish the 22 principles and then we're going to go into 13 dawabit on Sunday inshallah ta'ala and that will allow us الكريم, to finish the plan that we had for how to give da'wah and the correct way of giving da'wah each of these principles that I'm going to give from the 11 principles I'm going to give today I'm going to give it with three ways inshallah ta'ala or three approaches I'm going to take in explaining the principle the first one is I'm going to give you ma'an al qaida when I say the principle in Arabic I'm going to explain to you what does this principle mean and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the evidences these principle this principle has the evidence that it has from the Quran and the Sunnah and then the last point inshallah ta'ala is how this principle applies on da'wah how this principle applies on da'wah and of course i can't mention every field of the, how it can apply to da'wah i'll only mention that which i think is inshallah ta'ala is uh, befitting for the time that we have inshallah ta'ala so does everybody understand how we're going to take this inshallah ta'ala let's start with the first qaida the first principle the first principle is the first principle that we're going to speak about is every action is what is intended from it. This qa'idah, this principle, which is every action is what is intended from it. It is from what the scholars call al qawaid al khams al kubra. It is called the five 
maxim legals in Islam. The five major maxims in Islam. And it has a big effect in the religion. Imam al-Shafi'i, he said about this qa'idah, this principle, or this hadith of the Prophet, he said, هذا الحديث يعني حديث إنما العمال من يات He said it's ثلث العلم It's one third of knowledge ويدخل and it enters في سبعين بابا من الفقه And it enters 70 chapters of fiqh So now we have an understanding of what this قاعدة is We understand what this قاعدة means What does this قاعدة mean? It means that actions are based upon your intention Actions are based upon what? Based upon your intention. So if a person says a statement, if a person does an action, all of it is connected to the motive and the intention in why they said or did this. And so it's important to take into consideration the intention behind things. Because that is where the ruling is connected to. What's the evidence for this principle? The evidence for this principle is the hadith in which Bukhari and Muslim both narrated in their Sahih that the Prophet is the one who said this hadith. Innam al a'malu bin niyat is a principle but was said by the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. He said it. And the hadith is found in Bukhari and what? Muslim in hadith Umar ibn al Khattab. Also another hadith, also another hadith that is an evidence for this principle is. The hadith of the Prophet where he said, when they asked him, a man fights for his people. Yeah. Another man fights due to bravery. Another person he fights to show off. Which of those three are fighting for the sake of Allah? The messenger then said, Man qatala, anyone who fights, litakuna kalimat Allah al-uliya fawa fi sabilillah. Anyone who fights for Allah's speech to be high is the one who is fighting in the cause of Allah. So his, what's his maqsad is what's being looked at. His motive and his intention determines whether this is for the sake of Allah or not. And you all know the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu where he said, وَفِي بُضْئِ أَحَدِكُمْ صَدَقَةً The hadith of Idhar, which is in Sahih Muslim. وَفِي بُضْئِ أَحَدِكُمْ صَدَقَةً The word بُضْئِ in the Arabic language, it means the private part. But it's used in this hadith as intimacy. It's a kinaya. The Quran and the Sunnah do not speak about these things vulgarly. They don't say it like that. They speak about it kinaya, indirectly. The Prophet said, وَفِي بُضْئِ أَحَدِكُمْ صَدَقَةً One of you his intimate relationship, he gets a reward for it. When he has intimate relationship with his wife, he gets rewarded for it. So the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, ayati ahaduna shahwatahu, will one of us fulfill his desires, wa yakunu lahu fiha ajar? And then he gets a reward for it. Then the Prophet said, Araita la wada'aha fi haramin, akana alayhi fiha wizr. What about if he was to fulfill his private, his desires in haram? Would he get a sin for it? The Prophet said, فَكَذَلِكَ إِذَا وَضَعَ فِي الْحَلَالِ كَانَ لَهُ أَجَرُ The same way is that if he was to fulfill his desires in halal, he gets a reward for it. The Prophet, what he just did here right now is called قَاعِدَةُ الْعَكْسِ I'm a قِيَاسُ الْعَكْسِ, sorry. It's called قِيَاسُ الْعَكْسِ The Prophet used the opposite as the evidence for, for this particular issue. Meaning, we all agree that if a person goes, goes and does zina, what does he get? He gets a sin for it. The same way as he fulfills his desires in halal, he gets a what? He gets a reward for it. But listen, the hadith has told us that the motive in why he's fulfilled his desires in halal is to stay away from the haram. And then this niyyah is why he's getting rewarded for it. This intention of him wanting to leave off the muharramat, the zina, and doing it to protect himself and not to fulfill his desires in haram, he gets rewarded for it. So the niyyah is what he's, get, what he's getting rewarded for. Also the Prophet Sallallahu said in a hadith, إِنَّ بِالْمَدِينَةِ لَرِجَالَ In the city of Medina there are men. مَا سِرْتُمْ مَسِيرًا وَلَا قَطَعْتُمْ وَادِيًا إِلَّا كَانُوا مَعَكُمْ حَبَسَهُمُ الْمَرَضُ The Prophet Sallallahu said in Ghazwati Tabuk, 
in the Battle of Tabuk, when he was walking with some of his companions, he said, Inna fil Madinati la rijala. Inna bil Madinati la rijala. In Medina, there are men who haven't come with us to this battle. Masirtum masirah, wala qata'tum wadiyan. You do not cut a distance and you do not go through a valley except these individuals, they share reward with you. They share reward with you. Another riwayah says, Illa sharakukum fil ajr. Why? Habasahum al marad. The only thing what prevented them from not coming is that they were ill and they were unable to come. They wanted to come. They had the intention of wanting to come and to participate. But what prevented them from it is what? What is it that stopped them from it? The thing that stopped them from it is that they were unable to. So they're getting rewarded even that they're in Medina and they're not in the battlefield. What are they getting rewarded for? Aniyyatu Saliha. The good intention that they have. The good intention that that they have. The intention of a person, a person, if he comes with an intention that is stripped from any action, he has no actions, it's just a mere intention, but the intention is all good. You get rewarded for it. You get what? You get rewarded for it. Like the person who is what? Who wanted to do this thing, like in Habasahu al Marad, illness or a thing prevented him from it. Like a woman who was on her menses, she used to pray, she gets the reward of the praying that she missed. She used to fast on Mondays and Thursdays, she gets the reward of those days that she used to fast. She used to pray Qiyamul Layl, and while she's on this period of time, it's prevented her from praying her Qiyamul Layl. She gets the reward for all of that, due to what? An niya al-Saliha, the intention that she has. Iden an niya al-Saliha al-Mujarrada, just having a mere intention that's stripped from any actions, itself can give you reward. It can give you what? It can give you a reward. And also the opposite is true. If a person comes with actions that are noble and upright, but it's stripped from intentions, they lose the reward. They what? They lose the reward. A person comes with fasting, a person comes with salah, a person comes with zakat and hajj. They lose all of the reward because they didn't come with no intention. So this shows us what? The power and the place in which intention takes. So here we move on to the, the third point. So we explained what the Qa'idah meant. We gave the evidence that support this Qa'idah. We're now going to move on to how does this principle apply to Da'wah? The way that it applies to Da'wah is it is not permissible for a person to stand up to do Da'wah to attain worldly gain or to repel a worldly harm from yourself you're not allowed to do that because if you do do that and that is your motive then you're not going to succeed in the da'wah you're given so if your da'wah is to bring yourself great worldly gain or the motive behind your da'wah is so that you can repel from yourself worldly harm, then فَإِنَّ هَذَا لَا يَكَادُ يَنْجَحُ سَعْيَهُ This individual is striving and their hard work that they're exerting, it will come out with what? Nothing. هَبَاءً مَنْثُورًا وَلِذَلِكَ the salaf Some of them were asked, why is it that your statements are, have effect on the people? Why is it that you guys, when you speak to the people, that you've affected them and you made their hearts and their minds move. They said that we, they spoke, those, those people, they spoke from their hearts to the people's hearts. But we speak from our tongues to the people's mouth, their tongue. So it's everybody's, the heart has been stripped away from the, the action of calling to Allah wa ta'ala. The same way is, it is not permissible to warn against an individual, to warn against an individual, say, don't take knowledge from so and so, from with the intention of backbiting, with the intention of what? But the way that you try to manifest it to the people, and the way you try to show it to the people, and the way that you make it seem like is nusrat al sharia, that you're giving victory to the sharia, or you're trying to what? You're trying to protect the boundaries of the religion. 
So you're making it look like from the apparent that this is what it is. Like in, in your heart and in your mind, you have another agenda behind it. You have another agenda behind it. It's also permissible to boycott the innovators and the people of sins. It's also permissible to warn against them and mention their faults and their mistakes, but with the intention of what? Ibtigha al ajri min Allah, to attain reward from Allah. And you're doing this for what? La lihawa nafs. You're not doing it for your own whims and desires. You're not trying to get this person because they did something, you're getting them back. It's not why. The reason you're doing it is what? The reason why you're doing it is ibtigha al ajri min Allah. You're trying to attain reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The last point, inshallah ta'ala, is it is upon the da'i and the one who's given verdicts and answering people's questions and yanzura ila al ala al-a'mal that when people ask you questions, don't just look at the action that they're telling you. Look at the motive and the intention behind why they did this. Why? Because laha ta'athiru fil ahkami wal fatwa. It has an effect on the verdict that you're going to give and it also has an effect on the ruling that you're going to pass. And forsaking that and dismissing that and not looking at the motive and intentions behind things hasal galatun kathir due to it a lot of problems came from it when people don't look at it and they don't take into consideration the intentions we're now going to move on to the next qaida the next qaida is adharar la yuzalu or in other words la yuraddu batil bi batil this qa'idah, it says la adhararu harm. We're now moving on to the second principle. We've now spoke about the first. Wallahi, the first one itself is pages. And it can be spoken about months. And the statement of Imam al-Shafi'i who says that to you, which is a thuluth al-ilm, it's one third of knowledge. But we're summarizing and we're trying to finish things quickly. The second qa'idah is adhararu harm. لا يزال بالضرر it cannot be repelled with another harm other wording another wording is لا يرد باطل falsehood cannot be repelled and rejected with another falsehood بباطل in another falsehood and this قاعدة falls under one of the قواعد الكبرى خمسة الكبرى which is الضرر يزال that the harm is repelled it falls under that principle so the meaning of it is what as I mentioned, that a harm occurs. And then what you do is you want to remove this harm with another harm. Or you want to debunk or refute a falsehood or reject a falsehood or eradicate a falsehood, but with another falsehood that you bring about. The statement of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and also Suyuti in his Kitab al-Ashbah wal nadair and Al Imam Al Izm Ibn Abdi Salam Rahimahullah wrote a whole book on this issue. We're going to read a statement of theirs which I summarized, which is when it comes to the harm, is one of two. Either Ayakun al Dararun Nashi, the harm that's going to come from you trying to eradicate the harm that's already there. There's already a harm. You're trying to eradicate it, but there's a harm that's coming with it. A khafu min al-darar. It's less than the one that's already there. So you now ha you're trying to remove a harm that's there. But the harm that you're bringing about is, go is less than the ones that's already there. In this situation, without a doubt, ihtimalu akhafi al-dararayni li daf'i a'lahuma huwa al-muta'ayyan. To remove the greater harm with the lesser of harms, is without a doubt better. And in this situation, it becomes obligatory on you to repel the greater harm with the lesser of the two. The second situation is nashi. The harm that you're bringing about is greater than the present harm that's already there. Min al-hali. You're bringing about a harm greater than the harm that's already there. In this situation, then فَلَا يَجُوزُ أَنْ يُزَالَ الضَّرَرُ 
bima huwa awla bima huwa ashadd minhu it is not amma bima huwa a'la minhu it is not permissible for you to remove a harm with a greater harm that's without a doubt that is without a doubt you cannot remove a harm with a greater harm that you're bringing about but what about if the harm is equal to the harm that's already there so you have a harm that's already there a problem that's already there but you're bringing about a darar, a harm that's equivalent to it the scholars they say you're not also allowed to remove what a harm with a harm that's equal to it why because it could happen that the one that you're bringing may go beyond it it may go beyond it so there is not permissible for you to for you to come with it and the scholars they use it in other wordings they call it darul mafasid awla min jalb al masalih they use that what's the evidence for this qaida what is the evidence for this particular qaida the evidence for this is the statement of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is allah says in surah al hadid laqad arsalna rusulana bil bayyinat we sent our messengers with clear cut evidence wa anzalna ma'ahum al kitab and we sent with them books wa al mizan we sent with them scale why liyaquma al nas bil qisti so justice can be brought about justice means what that there's no harm that there's no harm justice means the removal of a dhulm and the tajawuz al had the exceeding of limits sharia came to bring about masalih masalih is adl it's justice the sharia didn't come to introduce harm whether that harm is greater or equal to it also shaykh al islam ibn jarir al tabari also uses qaida for that principle in his tafsir and also shaykh al islam ibn taymiyyah he mentions that in his majmu' al fatawa barakallahu fi in his majmu' al fatawa the third volume page 246 there's also a hadith of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that backs this qaida which is what an arabiyan bala fi al masjid a bedouin man urinated in the prophet's masjid and the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said to the companions do not stop him do not stop him from urinating let me let him finish let him finish the urinary urinating why did the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam allow him to finish the urinary urinating him urinating in the masjid is a dharar is a harm but why did the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam let him finish the urine because them stopping him is a greater harm why medical issue for him that when they stop him from urinating it could cause him any medical problems or the second harm that it has is that he may run from the place that he's at and then make the masjid more of it the urine reach so there's two harms and him urinating is only one harm so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he told them don't stop him let him finish the urine and then he requested sallallahu alaihi wasallam bidalw min ma fasub alayhi he requested for a a pot of water to be brought to him and he poured it over the urine so the wajh dalalah the way that we're trying to take from the hadith is that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he allowed him to finish off his urine knowing that there is harm in it so that he doesn't make the masjid even more he doesn't make the urine reach more of the masjid and it doesn't also cause him any harm also the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's hadith is another evidence for this qaida which is the prophet said satakunu athara wa umuru tunkirunaha after me there's going to be bad things that are going to occur they're going to be leaders who are oppressive and wrong doers they're going to harm you and physically bash you and take your wealth the prophet told us criminals are going to be the leaders look what the prophet then told us qalu ya rasulullah fama ta'muruna the companions they said ya rasulullah what do you command us to do the prophet said to adun al haqq alladhi alaykum you will fulfill the rights that are upon you wa tas'aluna allah alladhi lakum and you ask allah for your rights stop demanding for your right ask allah for it why because the umara al zalama the oppressive leaders 
who have Asrul Iman, they still believers, they haven't left the fold of Al-Islam, going against them, them being in power is, an, is a, a, a barar, it's a harm, without a shadow of a doubt. Them ruling over the Muslims is a barar, it's a harm. He's taking their money unjustly, he's bashing them unjustly, he's taking their, and he's causing harm. That's a barar. Like when you go against him, you're bringing about a greater harm. You're bringing about a what? A greater harm, or maybe even a harm that's equal to it. So what did the Sharia say? Ask Allah for your rights. Ask who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your rights and give him his rights that he has upon you. Meaning obey him and listen to him. That's what the Prophet means. Give him the rights that he has on you, which is to listen to him and to obey him. And we've seen that, that when the people have gone against oppressive leaders, the leaders who are unjust, who are tyrant leaders, the consequences was greater. More bloodshed took place. What they were looking for, they didn't attain it. Now, that doesn't mean that when it said don't go against him, that it's a iqrar, a consent to his evil. It doesn't mean that. And the person who then accuses you of accepting their oppression is a person who's speaking with no knowledge. We're agreeing there's a darar. We're agreeing there's a harm. But we're saying, الضرر لا يزال بالضرر. That a harm is not repelled with a harm either greater than it or equal to it. How does this affect, or how does this, we're now moving on to the third point, which is how does this go according to our topic which is da'wah. The way that it goes through it is that the da'i is it's definite that it's going to have opposition. Ya akhi, when you become a da'i, you have, you're going to have those who oppose you. And sometimes what's going to happen is that they're going to exceed their limits and their boundaries in your rights. They're going to be unjust to you. They're going to be unfair to you. And they will even speak about you in ways that are wrong. They may even make you a kafir and take you out of the fold of Islam. They may say that you are a fasiq, a transgressor. They may call you a mubtadi'. فَلَا يَجُوزُ It is not permissible for you to do exactly what they did to you. Or to go even worse than that. You're not allowed to do that. So the da'i knows this qa'id and is going to live by it. That if a person does takfir on you, you don't do takfir on them. If a person says to you, you're an innovator, you don't say, well, guess what? You're an innovator. You don't say any of that. Because الضرر لا يزال بالضرر the person learns this through his qa the qa'ida. Also, this qa'ida teaches us that it's prohibited to debate the innovators. And it's also prohibited to debate disbelievers. When you are trying to defend the truth with falsehood. You are trying to defend the truth by using that which is falsehood. Like for example, You've been put in a situation where somebody asks you what was the age of Aisha when the Prophet married her. And so you don't want to lose the debate. You speak kalam which is batil. When you know that the age of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha in Bukhari and other books that are dawawil sunnah the age of Aisha when the Prophet married her. So what do you say? You say it's masail khilafiyah. al darar la yuzalu bil darar It falls under this qa'ida. The religion does not need you. The religion does not need you to what? To defend it with falsehood. This qa'ida also teaches us that some people, they say that you're allowed to lie for the deen. This qa'ida shows you that you cannot refute or debunk falsehood with another falsehood. You can't lie for Allah. And say that lying against Allah is what's haram, and lying for Allah is what's permissible. A'udhu Billah. And there are some people's da'wah is like that. That they believe if it's the maslaha of the da'wah, you can lie. So this is not permissible. And this qa'idah, many other things fall under it. The person learns how to prioritize things. And they learn the maratib and the levels in which things are. Wa ma ila dhalik. The third qa'ida 
that we have to understand is a sharia this religion the sharia meaning the kitab and the sunnah جاءت بتحصيل المصالح وتكميلها وتعطيل المفاسد وتقليلها بحسب الامكان that the sharia came to bring about benefits it came to bring about good to complete good with us it came to bring about complete good for us and it came to remove harm or lessen it so the sharia what does it want to do it wants to bring about complete good if it can't it wants to bring a great amount of good and the sharia wants also to do what it went, wants to repel and eradicate harm in totality and if it's not able to lessen it this is what the sharia came to do and this is what qa this qaida means walidhalika al-izz ibn abdi salam rahimahullah al-izz ibn abdi salam rahimahullah sultan al-ulama who died in year 577 he has a book called qawaid al-ahkam it's called what qawaid al-ahkam his, this book of his, he says, was sharia, the religion, kulluha masalih. The whole religion is masalih. Imma tadra mafasid, aw tajlib masalih. It either repels harm or it brings about good. Remember this, the whole religion is about masalih. Everything that the sharia commands, there's good in it for us. Whether we know it or not. The sharia has either come to bring about good or it came to repel harm. That's what it came to do. And that is what this qa'idah means. Um, the masalih are three types. According to the scholars, the benefits, the good, are three types. And this is us looking at the masalih min haythu i'tibari shar'i laha wa adami. In terms of how the shari whether the sharia acknowledges it or not, it's categorized into three. The first of them is al masalih al mu'tabara. And we're going to do this issue of al-masalih and al-fasid. We'll do a more dis detailed explanation, inshallah ta'ala, bi-idhnillah al kareem But now we're just going to go over it fast. The first one is al-masalih al-mu'tabara. What does it mean? It means the considered type of benefit. I'm a, the, the, the sharia has taken this good into consideration. It is the type of masalih that there has come for it a dalil al shari The Qur'an and Sunnah are affirming it. The Qur'an and the Sharia has requested for it to be brought. The Sharia, the Qur'an and the Sunnah want it to be brought. And it wants the people to come with it. The second type is Al-Masalih Al-Mulghat. The second type is called Al-Masalih which ha? is Mulghat. It's the Masalih which the Sharia dismissed. And the Sharia said it doesn't want it. It looks like, the reason why the scholars are called Masalih al-Mulghat, it's that it looks like a good. What does it look like? From the apparent, it looks like a maslaha. What does it look like? From the zahir, when you look at it, it looks like a maslaha. Lakin, but it is a mafasid, it's actually a harm. How do we know it's a harm? Because the Sharia considered it to be a mafsada. The Sharia considered this to be a, a mafsada. For example, a woman wearing hijab, niqab on a sunny day. The masalih may look like that if she takes it off, or let's just say there's a, con a place where the women are all not wearing hijab. Okay? No one's wearing it. So if she did take her hijab off, she's not going to stick out. They're not going to see her. People probably may. So Masalih might seem to be that she can take off her hijab. It's not like anyone's going to look at her and everyone's going to give her attention because everybody else is doing it. And it's a sunny day and it's burning. Ah. All of that might seem to be a Masalih. Like, no, masalih it's actually a Mafasid. How do you know it's a Mafasid? The Sharia the actually dismissed it. And the fact that we know that the Sharia came with a Masalih and it didn't mention this shows us that it's a Mafasid. The second type is called Al-Masalih Al-Mursala. The third one is called Al-Masalih Al-Mursala. This is the one that the Sharia hasn't taken into consideration, nor has the Sharia dismissed it, nor has it spoken against it. 
Okay? And this one that the scholars, they permitted it with four conditions. They can permitted it when there is what? Four conditions. I'll ask you to go to the Al-Itisab by Imam Al-Shatabi, rahimahullah. You can find it there, inshaAllah ta'ala. And we'll speak about this in more. We'll speak about this in what? In more details, inshaAllah ta'ala. Also, the scholars, they categorize the masalih from another angle as well. The scholars, they cast the what? The masalih and the mafasid, the benefits and the harm. The scholars, they look at it from another approach as well. Just like a human being can be looked at from many approaches, different ways. Okay, I can look at you in terms of your height. Are you tall? Are you short? Are you average? I can look at you in terms of your complexion, your skin color. Are you dark? Are you light? I can look at you in terms of your weight. The same is with masalih. We can look at it from there many different angles. The first type of observation that we were looking at it is from the angle of whether the Sharia accepted it and took it into consideration or if it didn't. Now we're going to look at uh, Masalih in terms of its essence and what it is. The Masalih and the Mafasid. The scholars, they categorize this one into three. They categorize it into what? Into three. The first one is Al Masalih Al Khalisa. This, this issue is a, mas, a pure maslaha. It's pure. And the opposite is what? Al mafsadatul khalisa. The mafsada is pure. There's a pure mafsada in it. The scholars, they give an example for this is what? Al tawheed is maslaha khalisa. The maslaha of tawheed is khalis. There's no harm in it. And the mafsada which is khalis is shirk. The shirk. The second one is. It is not, it is not khalis. It is the masalih. It's, there's rajah and there's marjuh. There's not pure maslaha here. We have maslaha called rajaha. Second type is maslaha which is rajaha. There's a maslaha, the two maslahas, but one is a bit higher than the other one. What's it called? Maslaha rajiha. One is higher than the other. Before we just had only one maslaha, the first one, and it's pure maslaha, that's it. This one, there's a maslaha in it, there is also a harm in it as well. The scholars, they give example for this, like jihad. Jihad is maslaha, is not khalisa. It's a maslaha which is rajiha. How is it? There's a maslaha in it, which is what? That the kalimatullah here, the uliya is going to be high, and so that makes it rajih. The word of Allah is going to be high. The deen of Allah is going to be that's rajah. Like in there's mafsada in there. What's the mafsada? Children, some children are going to be orphans. They're going to lose their father. Wealth is going to be destroyed. You see, wealth are going to be destroyed. Uh, the honor and the blood of a believer is going to spill, which is a mafsada. And his life is going to go. All of these are mafasid. Like in it, what? Mafsada, maslaha, which is a rajah. The maslaha is what? Maslaha is rajah. Some, we have mafasid that are like that. Mafasid is rajiha. We have a mafsada, two mafsada, we have a mafsada, and a mas, so now the mas, mafsada is higher than the what? Then the maslaha, like Allah gave in the Quran, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْخَمْرِ وَالْمَيْسِرِ قُلْ فِيهِمَا إِثْمٌ كَبِيرٌ وَمَنَافِعُ لِلنَّاسِ وَإِثْمُهُمَا أَكْبَرُ مِنْ نَفْعِهِمَا The khamar has a maslaha and a what? A mafsada. Which one is greater? The mafsada is greater than the Maslaha, and then we said the maslaha rajah is not khalis. And we say alcohol has got benefit. They say a percentage of alcohol is good for the heart. So they say. Sahih. And other things they use it for. You see? So there is a maslaha in it. Like in the maslaha, the maslaha is marjuhiya. The mafsada is what? Rajah. The maslaha is higher. Are we all together? That's the second type. Um, are we all together? How many types did I say it was? Three. So we have Masarad. The third one is the Masalih and the Mafasid here are stuck together. And there's no way to detach one from the other. It became the Masalih and the Mafasid became what? It became Talazumul Masalih wal Mafasid. Tazahumil Mafasid if you may No. They became, both of them became what? Both of them became connected to one another and attached to one another. 
What is the analysis of masbahth that requires a lot of discussions and examples? But what is the evidence for it? The evidence is قوله تعالى يسألونك عن الشهر الحرام خيتان فيه قل قتال فيه كبير وصد عن سبيل الله وكفر به والمسجد الحرام وإخراج أهله منه أكبر عند الله والفتنة أكبر من القتل. As I mentioned, jihad. Jihad is the ayahs, Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah 217. That the jihad, it's the bloodshed, what's taking place, what's worse than that? Allah says, well, fitna to the kufr is greater than the dying of the people. <laughs> and other evidences that the scholars, rahimahullah, mentioned. The, uh, one example for that is the one that we mentioned for the leaders. The hadith that we mentioned, for the leaders. How does this qa'ida apply to us in this issue that we're talking about, which is a da'wah? How does it apply to us? The way that it applies to us is if the du'at and those who are giving da'wah and the people of knowledge and the people of virtue, they withhold, they withhold with what? Praying behind an individual who used to do major sins. They say, we're not going to pray behind him. We're not going to pray behind this individual. He used to drink khamar. And they withhold from him. But in their hearts, they make dua for him. This is permissible. Why? We are able to bring two maslahas together without having to get rid of one. The us not praying behind him is a maslaha. Why? The way that it's a maslaha is because it's going to make others not go towards drinking alcohol. If they see the people of knowledge, if they see what? The du'at, not praying behind an alcoholic who died upon alcohol. But then they still go home and they make du'a from Allah, Allah maghfillah, warhamu. They've combined between what? A maslaha, which is not to pray behind him, and the maslaha of what? Of making what? Du'a for him. They, that's permissible for them to do. Why is it permissible? Because they attain both of the maslaha. And how did they learn that? They used the qaida and the principles that we mentioned. Also the person learns by this principle, the boycotting of the innovators and boycotting of people who are upon major sins and are doing wrong. People who are upon sins and people are upon crimes. Boycotting them and turning away from them. Isn't boycotting a Muslim not a harm? It is a great harm. It is a what? There's a harm in it. The person will learn from this principle. Is there a, is there a maslaha here in boycotting this individual? Because why am I boycotting him for? Ba'fi sharrihim. I want to weaken their evil. What do I want to do? I want to, I want to weaken their evil. I don't want them to drink alcohol. I don't want innovation to spread. That's my purpose. But if I know that this will not be attained through this, I know it will not occur, I know it won't happen, then I will look at the ruling here, basing on observing the masalih and the mafasid. That da'i would look into, into this issue. Also the person learns from this, la yukhatabu al-insan, a person is not addressed in that which he is unable to comprehend. You don't speak to the people in that which their minds and their hearts can't comprehend. Why? Because they're going to fall into a greater harm by telling them that which they can't comprehend. The statement of Ali ibn Abi Talib, where he said, Lasta bi muhad, and he said, Hadithu nasa bima ya'arifun, aturiduna an yukadab Allah wa rasuluh. Tell the people that which they can understand. Do you want them to disbelieve, disbelieve in Allah and the Day of Judgment? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, لست بمحدث قوما حديثا لم تبلغ عقولهم إلا كان لبعضهم فتنة عبد الله بن مسعود he said you do not talk to a people about a matter which their minds cannot comprehend and they cannot understand except it becomes a greater fitna for them so you're going to weigh the masalih and the mafasid is it wise for me to say this statement right now and should I say it is this going to bring a shak and hayra confusion and doubts to the people's hearts or is it something I should not say the person will know what to say and what not to say. You'll also learn from this, as many might ask, 
Are you allowed to go to places where muharramat and things that are wrong that are happening? Can I go to a Friday night club and stand in front of it to stop the people from entering it and give da'wah there? Am I allowed to do it? No, you can't do that. Dar'an lil mafsadati al-mutawakka'ah. No, you're not allowed to do that because of the harm that's going to happen when you stand there. You may be from those who are going to go into there. The music that you're going to hear, the women who's co who are not covered and they're dressed in the way that they're dressed. You're going to see that and it's going to hit your heart. All of that you're learning through this. You're learning all through this qa'idah. You're not allowed to do that. Now we're going to move on to the fourth qa'idah. Which is الوجوبُ مُعَلَّقٌ بِالِسْتِطَاعَةِ That the obligation is connected to ability. The da'i needs to know this fourth principle. Which is that obligation is connected to the ability. The word الوجوب is فُعُول مِنْ وَجَبَ It comes from the form of فُعُول which is وَجَبَ That is obligatory. And you know the Arabic language, the word Wajaba it means a sakata when something drops. Allah says in the Quran, Faida wajabat junubuha when the camel's side falls to the side. The way that they would slaughter the cow, and so the camel would be by tying its leg, one of its leg, that when you cut its throat, because it was standing on three and not four, when it moves it will fall on its side, so it will die quicker. Allah says in the ayah, فَإِذَا وَجَبَتْ جُنُوبُهَا When it falls on its right on its side. So the word that's used is وَجَبَ إِسَقَطَ It falls on the ground. So the word wajib in the language, it means it means a suqut and it has other meanings as well. But that's one of its meanings. But what does it mean in the sharia? It means مَا طَلَبَهُ الشَّارِعُ فِعْلَهُ It is what the sharia requested for you to do in a forceful manner. It is that which the Sharia requested for you to do على وجه الإلزام in a what? In a forceful? In a forceful manner. You have to do this. You have to. You have to do it. The istita'a is necessary for every action that a person does. A person cannot come with something unless he has qudra and ability. And the ability is two types. The first one, al-istita'atu fil ilmi. The ability in knowledge. What does that mean? It means, at-tamakkun min al-ilmi bihaythu tatahayya'u subula. The first one is that the person has the ability to comprehend what is being said to them. The sharia does not hold account for a person who is ignorant. Because they have lack of ability. They haven't understood what was being said to them. So the first one is al-istita'atu ala al-ilm. That the person, he is able to comprehend and nusus the textual evidences of what they are saying to him. If he can't, then he is what? He is ghayru qadir. He is unable to do this. The second one is al-istita'ah ala al-amal. That he is able to then do the action. He has the knowledge. He has the ruling with him. He understood what Allah and His Messenger have said to him. But the second part is missing from him, which is al istita'at al al ilm. He's unable to understand. He's sorry. He's unable to do this action. He's unable to do the action. He's unable to come with this action, or he's unable to stay away from this particular issue. What's the evidence for this qaida? The evidence for this qaida is the statement of Allah: لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. That Allah does not burden an individual except in accordance to their ability. So the person is commanded to do something or is commanded to stay away from something all based upon what? Their ability. The person is what? Is told to come with something based on what? Based on their ability. Also Allah says in another ayah, وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجٍ Allah did not make the religion haraj for you. And haraj means what? Allah hasn't made it something you're unable to do. Allah wa ta'ala, what He does and He wants you to do is what? Is that which is in accordance to your ability. 
And you all know the famous hadith of Al-Imam uh, in which Al-Imam Al-Bukhari and Muslim both narrated in their Sahih. And the wording that I'm going to mention is the wording of Imam Muslim in hadith Abi Hurairah. Abi Hurairah, um, Abdul Rahman ibn Sakh al-Dawsi. He said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Da'uni ma taraktukum, leave that which I have left for you. فَإِنَّمَا أَهْلَكَ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ Those who came before you were destroyed for what? Their excessive questioning and their asking of too much. وَاخْتِلَافُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنْبِيَائِهِمْ And their opposition towards their prophets. Then the Prophet said, فَإِذَا نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْ شَيْءٍ If I prevent you and prohibit you from something, فَاجْتَنِمُهُ Stay away from it. وَإِذَا أَمَرْتُكُمْ But if I command you something, بِشَيْءٍ فَأْتُمْ مِنْهُمْ أَسْتَطَعْتُمْ Come with that which you're able from it. So the scholars, they say that to do a command is in accordance to what? To do a command is in accordance to what? To follow the Quran and the Sunnah is in accordance to your ability. But the ayah and hadith didn't say when it came to staying away from something, it didn't say your ability. It didn't say your ability. It says, فَإِذَا نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْ شَيْءٍ If I prevent you and prohibit you from something, فَاجْتَنِبُوا Stay away from it. But then it said, وَإِذَا أَمَرْتُكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ But if I command you something, فَأْتُوا Come with that which you're able to do. Come with that which you're, that which you're able uh, to do. Also the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, مَنْ رَأَى مِنْكُمْ مُنْكَرًا فَلِوَيِّرْهُ بِيَدِهِ Whichever of you who sees evil, he should stop it with what? If you see evil, what should you do? Stop it with your hand. What about if you're not able to? فَإِنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ فَبِلِسَانِهِ Do it with your tongue. فَإِنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ You can't do it with your tongue. فَبِقَلْبِهِ Do in your heart وَذَلِكَ أَضْعَفُ الْإِيمَان And that is the weakest of iman. Abi Sa'id al-Khudri رضي الله تعالى عنه narrated this and it's found in Sahih Muslim. So the Prophet conditioned our ability to what? Our ability to command good and prohibit evil. So what is it that we take from this qa'idah that applies with our da'wah? What it applies with is, of course, that every individual from amongst us in this ummah, what is upon them and that which is obligatory on them to stand for in da'wah is bima yaqdiru alayhi, that which he's able to do. Everyone from amongst us has to give da'wah in accordance to his ability. That is, if somebody else hasn't stood for it. If somebody else hasn't stood up for this obligation, then you have to come with that which you're able to do. If somebody else stands up to do it, then the obligation is what? It's uplifted from you because a da'wah is fardu kifaya. The obligation of da'wah is not an individual obligation, it's a communal obligation. It's a what? It's a communal obligation, it's not an individual obligation. The benefit that we take from this qa'idah that applies to our da'wah, the understanding of da'wah is that the asal of prohibiting evil is the hand. And if you're not able to, it's your tongue. And if you're not then able to, it becomes your heart and that is the weakest of what? That is the weakest of al-iman. So if the Ahlul Fudur, the criminals and the wrongdoers, they're not listening to the prohibition. They're not coming with the commands that they're given. Then what? The retaliation, it should be done in accordance to the ability. The people can actually repel them physically, like a leader or somebody like that, then they should do so and stop them. The Ahlul Fujur and Ahlul Fisq, Ahlul Fasad. If they are not able to, then they use what is needed, what is next in line. The same is with the Da'i. He does the same in his da'wah. Sometimes he's going to use his hand. Sometimes he's going to use his speech. And sometimes he's going to what? He's just going to have to dislike it in his heart. And that is the weakest of iman. Also what we take from this hadith is, if a people reside in a land, for example that land may be the land of the disbelievers, or it may be land of the innovators, you stay in a land like that, and you're unable to migrate, you can't leave that land, you don't have the ability to do so, then what is obligatory is that which is in accordance to your ability. Also what we take from this hadith is if you're made a qadi, a person makes you a judge in a particular situation, 
and or you're made a judge, a general judge, your general qadi, and you're unable to fulfill the justice that you wanted to bring about. You're unable to do it. You can't do it. There's somebody there who's not letting you do it. Then it's obligatory upon you to do what? To do that which is according to your wusr, your ability. Do as much as according to your ability that you can. Allah does not burden a slave more than that which they can carry. Also what we take from this hadith is that it's permissible. That it's permissible for the du'at. That they delay conveying a particular message and a particular matter from the matters of the religion because they are not able to do it at this particular moment. That, so they delay this information. They withhold this information for a period of time until they find the ability to speak about it and they find the ability to address this particular issue. The fifth qa'ida, mm -hmm. the fifth qa'ida that we speak about inshallah ta'ala is al-asl fil ibadat at-tawqif that the asal in ibadat is what? The asal of ibadat is a tawqif What does tawqif mean? at tawqif What does it mean? It means nasu al-shari' al-muta'alliq bi ba'd al-umur. That it means this particular issue it needs a textual evidence. You're not allowed to go forward in this issue unless you have a textual evidence. The du'at have to understand that when a matter is ibadah, it's not permissible for you to go forward and to do this thing unless you have a textual evidence. What is the textual evidence? Al-Kitab wa Sunnah. You have the Kitab and the Sunnah that is allowing you to do this. Now this ibadah can be what? Any of the three places where ibadah occurs from, which is what? Your speech. You can't say something which is a ibadah unless you have evidence for it. You can't do something which is a ibadah unless you have evidence for it. You can't believe in a matter which is ibadah unless you have evidence for it. You, all of those require what? They require evidence. وَلِذَلِكَ الشَّيْخُ الْإِسْلَامِ ibn تَيْمِيَةِ in his Majmu'u al-Fatawa ama Fatawa al-Kubra which is called it's called what? Al-Fatawa al-Kubra the second volume, page 93. There's difference between Majmu' al-Fatawa and Fatawa al-Kubra two different ones. Ibn Taymiyyah says in his Al-Fatawa al-Kubra second volume, page 93, he says فَجِمَعُ عَيْمَةِ الدِّينِ أَنَّهُ لَا حَرَامَ that the ulama of the religion unanimously agree upon أَنَّهُ لَا حَرَامَ إِلَّا مَا حَرَّمَهُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ that there is no haram except that which Allah and His Messenger make haram وَلَا دِينَ and there's no religion إِلَّا مَا شَرَعَهُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ except that which Allah and His Messenger legislated and then there's no deen except through which channels through the Quran or the Sunnah so anything which a person is bringing into the deen, he has to bring it either from the Quran or the, from the Quran or the, from the Quran or the Sunnah. So this qaida, that's what it means. The religion stands on these two principles. The religion stands on what? These two fundamental principles, which is Allah that we worship Allah wahdahu la sharika lah. That we worship Allah alone and we don't associate partners with Him. We single Him in worship. And the second one is Al-Na'budah That we worship Allah Bima shara'ahu ala lisani rasulihi That we worship Allah In the way um, the, uh, We worship Allah According to what he legislated On the Prophet's tongue We don't worship him Sallallahu alayhi wa jalla We don't worship Allah Azza wa jalla Bil ahwa'i wal bid'a How our desires likes and how is in accordance to our whims? No, we don't. We do it in accordance to what? We do it in accordance to that which Allah legislated on the tongue of His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because who are we trying to worship? Allah. He will tell us how He wants us to do it. He will tell us how He wants us, how he wants us to do it. The actions that are transmitted to us from the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam is of two types. Actions that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he done it in a particular form. He did it in a surah mu'ayyana, in a particular way. 
What do we mean by a particular way? He restricted it to a particular time, for instance, or he restricted it to a particular place, for instance, and he was getting closer to Allah by that. Then what is legislated for us is to follow the Prophet ﷺ in the way he did it. If he did it in a particular time, we do it in that particular time. If he did it in a particular place, we do it in the particular place he did it. If he got closer to Allah by doing it, we get closer to Allah by doing it. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرَ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا That in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a good example. In the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a good example for us. The second type is the Prophet did this action alayhi salatu wasalam not because he was trying to get closer to Allah by it and that can be one of two types the second one can be one of what? two types for example that which he did because it was jibilli and he was like this Allah created him like this the way he walked the way he talked the way he carried himself all of that it falls under that which he did وَلَيْسَ عَلَى وَجْهِ الْعِبَادَةِ وَالْقُرْبَةِ are we all together? Or that which he did, which is the second that falls under that, that which he did because of his culture. Ada, his people were like this, and he did it because of his culture and the people he was from. This one we say, فَلَا يُشْرَعُ الْإِقْتِدَاءُ بِهِ فِي ذلك. It is not permissible for you to follow, in the, follow him in this one. You're not allowed to follow him in it, alayhi salatu wasalam. What's the evidence for this qa'idah? The evidence for this qa'idah is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala اتبعوا ما أنزل إليكم من ربكم Follow your Lord Follow, sorry, اتبعوا ما أنزل إليكم Follow that which has been sent to you from your Lord وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا مِن دُونِهِ أَوْلِيَاء قَلِيلًا مَا تَذَكَّرُونَ And don't follow besides them أَوْلِيَاء Allies Little do the people take reminder and little do they ponder and contemplate Also Allah says وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِي مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوا وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلَ فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ ذَلِكُمْ وَصَّاكُمْ بِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ That this is my path, the straight path, follow it. And do not follow the paths that were set by others. It will divide, it will divide you and it will scatter you into many other groups. ذَلِكُمْ وَصَّاكُمْ بِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Also Allah says, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِ يُحْبِبُكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Say to them, Muhammad, that if they love Allah, then let them follow the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah will love them. And Allah will forgive them for their sins. Also Aisha radiallahu ta'ala, عَنْ هَا وَعَنْ أَبِيهَا May Allah be pleased with her and her father, that she said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, مَنْ أَحْدَثَ فِي أَمْرِنَا هَذَا مَا لَيْسَ مِنْهُ فَهُوَرَدْ Anyone who introduces in our religion that which is not from it, it will be rejected to that individual. Bukhari and Muslim both narrated this hadith. So all of this shows us what? All of this shows us that the asal of ibadah is a what? Is a tawakkuf. Is to withhold. Unless you find the textual evidence that supports it. Unless that you find textual evidence that supports it. How does this principle apply to the fiqh of da'wah? It applies in the following way. Number one, it is not permissible for any individual to legislate for the people a type of adhkar or a type of dua or for them to legislate for the people a type of righteous deeds which they have no textual evidence for. They're not allowed to. And that is what? Ibtida'un. That is innovating in the religion. The benefit that we take from this hadith also is it is not permissible for anybody that it's not permissible for anybody to follow the mistakes and the shortcomings of the scholars and their errors because why Allah has forgiven the scholars for their mistakes we were commanded to follow who we were commanded to follow that which was sent unto us from our Lord and we were not commanded to follow allies besides other Allah the other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when their statement goes against the statement of Allah and His Messenger. 
Also, this qa'ida teaches us what? Laysa li ahadin. It is not permissible for anybody. An yansiba lil nasi shakhsan. That the, the, it's not permissible for any individual to take an individual and place that person as an icon for the people. يَدْعُوا إِلَىٰ طَرِيقَةِ That they call the people to this person's path. وَيُوَالِي وَيُعَادِي عَلَيْهَا And you show love and hate based on the, that person. وَلَا يَنْصُبَ And it is also not permissible for you to place the statement of a person as an icon. يُوَالِي عَلَيْهِ You show allegiance based on that statement. And you show hate and enmity based on that statement other than the statement of Allah and His Messenger. وَمَا اجْتَمَعَتْ عَلَيْهِ الْأُمَّةِ And that which the Ummah unanimously agreed upon. بَلْ هَذَا مِنْ فِعْلِ أَهْلِ الْبِدَعِ Rather doing this is from the action of the innovators. Who is the only one whose statement and actions we base love and hate on. And that we force the people to follow Allah and His Messenger. Allah and His Messenger. Anyone other than that, his statement is either taken or it's what? It's rejected. And their statement is looked at. Is it in line with the speech of Allah? Is it in line with the Quran? If it is, it's taken. And if it's not, it's rejected. It's what? It's rejected. This qa'ida, that's what it teaches us. And then we learn that the du'at, we learn that the ulama, they are what? Open for mistakes. They are open to do errors and shortcomings. And we don't make the people follow what? The zallat al-ulama, the hafawat that come from the scholars. We have evil individuals who've made their deen and their religion based upon what? Bringing and gathering the statements of who? The mistakes and the errors of the scholars. And that's their whole religion. So every time you say to them, Ya Akhi, why are you, why are you doing this for? He'll say, Imam Fulan, Ibn Fulan, he's the one who believes this. And then he says to you again, that when you say, why are you saying this? I mean, why don't you do this? He will say to you, well, guess what? Fulan ibn Fulan didn't see this to be obligatory, so, not, so I don't have to do it. And then his whole religion is what? Tatabbu' It's following the rukhas. And it's following the zalat of the ulama. People like that, they are on a path where they, where they become heretics. And zanadiqah. The scholars, they used to say, man tatabba' Anybody who follows the rukhas. He gathers all of the evidences and the lean rulings. The rulings which are soft, he takes them. And he takes all of the mistakes of the scholars. What, does he do? what happens to him? Tazandaqa, he becomes a zindiq, a heretic. So a da'i will stay away from all of that. The sixth qa'ida in which the person needs to know and understand is لا واجب في الشريعة إلا بشرع أو عقد That there's nothing which is obligatory unless the sharia makes it obligatory or unless a contract and a transaction makes it obligatory nothing is obligatory on a person unless the quran and the sunnah make it obligatory or unless a what a transaction forced this obligation to come about maybe that maybe this person made it obligatory on themselves or maybe and etc the obligations that are on the people are two types the first one is that which is obligatory on the person because Allah made it obligatory on them like the salawat al-khams, the five daily prayers, mm -hmm. fasting, hajj, birrul walidayn, silatul arham, keeping the ties of kinship, obedient towards your parents. This is obligation, it came when you reached the age of taklif. It started with you, so you have to come with it. There's a second type of obligation, which is what? مَا وَجَبَ عَلَى النَّاسِ بِرَغْبَةِ مُخْتِيَارِهِمْ It became obligatory on you because you made it obligatory on yourself. You chose it. You either got yourself into a, a act, a transaction, a mu'amala, a dealing, buying or selling it maybe, and etc. Now it becomes obligatory for you to have to follow, to have to follow this. What's the evidence for this qa'idah? The evidence for this qa'idah is the statement of Allah. أَمْ لَهُمْ شُرَكَاء شَرَعُوا لَهُمْ مِنَ الدِّينِ مَا لَمْ يَأْذَنْ بِهِ اللَّهِ وَلَوْ لَا كَلِمَةُ الْفَصْلِ لَقُضِيَ بَيْنَهُمْ وَإِنَّ الظَّالِمِينَ لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ Allah says in this ayah, أَمْ لَهُمْ شُرَكَاء شَرَعُوا لَهُمْ مِنَ الدِّينِ مَا لَمْ يَأْذَنْ بِهِ اللَّهِ Do they have legislators who are legislating for them, saying that this is wajib when Allah and His Messenger haven't given permission for this? In other words, the ayah is telling us that the one who legislates and the one that makes something wajib 
And the one that makes something haram is who? Allah and His Messenger. They're the ones who do that. No one else. That's what the ayah shows us. That this is in whose hands? Because wajib is from the ahkam al shariya at talabiya Sahih. Is it not from it? It is from it. Who is the one who does the ahkam al shariya Who sets it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And His Messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How does this principle apply to our particular issue, which is a da'wah? The way that it applies to it is, you're not allowed to force and oblige on people and make it mandatory on them, that which is not mandatory on them, that which is not obligatory on them. For example, you can't force the people to follow a particular shaykh and say, you have to follow this shaykh. Or you can't make obligatory on the people and say, you have to follow a particular madhab. You can't force on the people to have to blind follow a particular individual. You're not allowed to what? To place for the people a person which they have to follow. You don't have to. You can't. The question is, who proceeds? Where's the evidence for that? Because this wujub is a what? To make something obligatory, it requires a textual evidence, right? Quran and Sunnah. Also, this hadith is what? Oh, also this sorry qaida the way that it applies with da'wah is la yajuzu li ahad min an-nas ka'ina man kana it is not permissible for any individual whoever they may be and you khalif ma ma tabayyana lahu min ash-shar' it is not permissible for a person whoever they may be and however high they may be in their status to oppose that which has come clear to them from the sharia li mujarrad al-aqd alladhi iltazamahu li madhhab aw tariqatin wa nahwaha based on an agreement that you had with somebody or something or a particular sheikh that you follow also it is not permissible for the what? it is not permissible for the du'at To make obligatory on the people things that are not obligatory. Like some people, what they say is when a person repents and he comes to repentance, they say to him, Iqraju sadaqah min malik. You know what you have to do? Now that you've repented, you have to give some of your money as a sadaqah. It's obligatory for you to do that. Or um, you have to cook food and you have to call all the people and they have to eat. So it's obligatory for you to do this for your repentance to be accepted. It is not a, a, a permissible for you to do that to a person and to force them to do that because it requires what? It requires evidence. Well, a lot of people are forced to do things which there is no textual evidence for it. There is no textual evidence for it. Now, we'll stop there today, inshallah ta'ala. We'll try to finish the other principles. Next. On Monday, we, uh, sorry, on Saturday, we were meant to do twen today 11, but we did 6. So, inshallah, ta'ala, we'll try to finish on Saturday. Anything which I have said that was wrong or incorrect is from me, shaitan, and Allah and His Messenger are free from it. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik, ashadu wa la ilaha illallah, astaghfiruka wa tuwilayh.